I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Luke chapter 18. Eighteenth chapter of the book of Luke. This morning we'll start by reading verses 31 through 34. Luke 18, verse 31. Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem. And all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him. And the third day, he will rise again. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them. And they did not know the things which were spoken. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on His Word. Father, as we pause this moment to open Your precious Word, we ask that We'd focus on the text of Scripture and well, not necessarily a message dedicated to a New Year's theme. It certainly can't get any better than what this text says that we just read. Father, I pray that we would see the mistakes the disciples made and we'd see the truth that the Savior said. Lord, we'd find encouragement and blessing in this hour. Father, I agree with John the Baptist when he said, I must decrease and Christ must increase. Hide this foolish preacher behind the cross of Christ, that Christ alone might be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I used this illustration years ago, but I think it's appropriate to bring it back for another go-around. When I was in college, I was driving my truck in Greenville, South Carolina, when the shifter knob on the stick of my manual transmission came right off in my hand. I headed to the automotive department at Walmart, quickly found what I was looking for, instant bonding super glue. You know why they call it instant bonding super glue? Yeah, it lives up to its name. I drove back to my dormitory and pulled into my parking spot. I opened the package of glue, but I, I couldn't get the cap off that metal tube. And so I did what comes natural to every man. I put the glue in my mouth and twisted. And, and when I did, my canine tooth pierced the metal tube and super glue filled my mouth. I panicked. And in my panic, my tongue touched the roof of my mouth. I found out another reason why they call it instant bonding super glue. And for the next 20 minutes, I heard my mother from a thousand miles away say, I told you not to open things with your teeth. It's one of those I told you so kind of moments. Parents, you ever have those kind of moments with your kids? If you do this, this will happen. Huh? Told you so. Sometimes children need to learn that way, and we as adults do too. Do I still open things with my teeth to this day? Of course I do. I'm a male. <laughs> That's what we do. But you know, as we come to Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 34, we see the foundation of an I told you so kind of moment with Jesus and his disciples. We started this sermon series, The Chronology of Christ, on September 7th, 2017. That was a long time ago. We are going to conclude this series on April 9th, 
2023, which happens to be Easter Sunday. In order to get from here to there, though, we're going to see this last few weeks of Jesus' life here on earth. Where did he go? What did he do? What did he say? And how did he prepare his disciples for his departure off this earth? So I've entitled this home stretch, this final stretch of this sermon series, as the death march of the Messiah. Dr. Luke, in his writings, documents Jesus travels in and out of Jerusalem. At different times in his gospel, Luke tells us that Jesus is looking towards or setting his face or his sight on Jerusalem. Go with me over to Luke chapter 9, verse 51. I want to show you this pattern. Luke 9, verse 51. Now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, there's a little bit of theological debate. Is this the ascension? It very well could be the ascension. But it's a very interesting word in the way that it's used here in the Greek language. I tend to think that it means for him to be lifted up. Lifted up high on the cross of Calvary for all the world to see. He steadfastly did what? He set his face to go to Jerusalem. This is the beginning of what commentators call Luke's tra tra travel narrative. Go over to Luke 13.22. Luke 13, verse 22. And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward where? Jerusalem. Go to chapter 17, verse 11. Luke 17, verse 11. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Now back to our text, chapter 18, verse 31. And he took the twelve aside and said, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. Well, it doesn't end there. Now we see Luke chapter 19, verse 28. And when he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? It is because Jerusalem is the apex location of all redemptive history. The Bible doesn't say necessarily where exactly Adam was created. You ever wondered that? When I was in Christian school, I just learned that there was this green fertile crescent thing that went from what seemed to northern Israel in a crescent form over to Baghdad, Iraq area, which would be Babylon, and maybe it was somewhere in there. Well, I can't find that in the scriptures. God doesn't necessarily say, I created Adam right here. But here's what is interesting, is that rabbis in the ancient Jewish Talmud teach that Adam was created on the foundation stone. Have you ever heard of the foundation stone? Where is it? There is a shrine currently in the city of Jerusalem. And the shrine's name is the Dome of the Rock. It is a Muslim shrine that sits on top of the Temple Mount. Do you know what is the rock in the Dome of the Rock? It is what the Jews call the foundation stone. According to Jewish legend and rabbis, they believe Adam was created right there on top 
of the Temple Mount. Biblically, I don't have anything that clarifies that, but I don't have anything to refute it and say it's wrong either. But nevertheless, if you look at the history of the Temple Mount is what we call it today, it is an important site in the will of God. So for example, it's the site that Abraham was told to bring Isaac for a sacrifice there on the top of Mount Moriah. It is where God provided a sacrificial ram for Isaac. It is the site which David purchased from Ornan the Jebusite in order to reserve it for Israel's temple. It's the site that Solomon built the first temple, which Nebuchadnezzar then destroyed. A second temple was rebuilt by 515 B.C., but in 54 B.C., Marcus Licinius Crassus of Rome plundered that temple, stole the money from the treasury, and as a result triggered the rebuilding of the temple by Herod the Great, which was now known as the Second Temple or Herod's Temple. That was the temple at the time of Jesus. Where is that temple now? It was leveled in 70 AD. However, on that same site, a third temple will be built sufficient for sacrifice during the tribulational period. On that site, a fourth temple will be built in the millennium where Jesus Christ will literally rule and reign for 1,000 years on the throne of David. And of course, that is the site where the new Jerusalem will center upon for your future home if you know Christ as Savior. Jerusalem is the apex location for redemptive history. It all takes place around Jerusalem. So when Luke says that Jesus turns his face towards Jerusalem, it's a powerful moment. This is it. This is what he had come for. When he said, we are going to Jerusalem, to his disciples, he is announcing, if you will, the death march to the cross. This is it. These are his final steps. It's a very emotional moment in which Jesus will lay out the path to his disciples and say, in the next few weeks, this is going to happen. They were up in Perea. When we think of Jerusalem, we think of the temple, the old city. I believe this one is probably the third rendition of Jerusalem. But we think of the Temple Mount being the center. All the trials of Jesus, we're going to go through and show you where I believe historically things would have happened. Now, understand that Jerusalem has been ransacked and rebuilt many times through the years. And it seems like there's a few religions that just like to build churches and shrines and mosques all over ancient Jerusalem. So we don't know all the sites. But it will be important that as we take our tour through Jerusalem that you understand where it is. Jesus was up in what we call Perea. When he says, we are going to now travel down, technically he's coming through Jericho. Of course, that's not the rebuilt Jericho, right? The walls went tumbling down. And he will make his way then into Jerusalem. He is going to say, this is it. This is my final hour. But what it really just shocks me is Luke chapter 18, verse 34. Did you catch it? But his disciples understood none of these things. The sayings were hid from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken. Does that trouble you at all? This is not the first time that Jesus has stated, I am going to Jerusalem to die and resurrect. Turn with me over to Matthew chapter 16. Start reading in verse 13.
Matthew 16, verse 18. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, that's out on the coastline, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? Oh, I'm sorry. Who, who do men say I, the Son of Man, am? And they said in him, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, or very literally uh, hell, will not prevail against it. That is the place of the dead, the realm of the dead. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. Verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show them, his disciples, that he must go to where? Jerusalem. And he must suffer Many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, Far be it from you, Lord, that this should happen to you. But Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. Now, I don't think that Jesus is saying that Peter was demonically possessed here. The word Satan means adversary. Peter's just off because he doesn't understand that if Jesus doesn't die, we don't have a Savior. So it's a word of correction. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Peter, you are selfish. And so Jesus starts off and says, listen, I am going to have to die. Go to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. The context is that Jesus, Peter, James, John have just come down off the Mount of Transfiguration. They find the disciples in a kerfuffle. There's a boy who has a demon, and the disciples are not able to cast it out, but Jesus does so and heals the boy. Parallel passage is Matthew 19. But look at Mark chapter 9, verse 30. They departed from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. Is Jesus being very, very clear here? Indeed, he is. Go to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asked something from him. He said to her, what do you wish? She said, grant that these two sons of mine may sit on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. And Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with a baptism that I am about to be baptized with? They said unto him, We are able. <laughs> really? What is Jesus referring to? His death, burial, and resurrection. He said to them, Oh, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized, the baptism that I am baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, for it is those whom it is prepared by my Father. Would James and John go through persecution after Jesus' ascension? Oh, yes. Yes. So they would find out. My point is this morning, as we go back to Luke chapter 18, 
Is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection hidden from the disciples? No. Multiple times in his teaching that we have recorded in Scripture, Jesus is going to say, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to die, and on the third day, I am going to resurrect. But what does Luke chapter 18, verse 34 say? But they understood none of these things. How is that possible? Put yourself in the women's shoes as they found the angel at Jesus' tomb who said in Matthew 28, 6, He is not here, for he is risen. Then what did the angel say? As he said. Imagine that you are Peter and John sprinting to the tomb of Jesus after the women give their report and Jesus is not there. Imagine being in the room with the disciples when the Lord appears to them and Thomas crumbles. My Lord and my God. And Jesus replies, why are you troubled? Why do you doubt in your hearts? And it is this I told you so moment. It's no secret. It's not a hidden mystery. It was as plain as day. They missed it. Why did the disciples miss it? I would suggest two possible reasons. Number one, they heard the words, but they weren't listening. Kind of like some of you right now. You hear Charlie Brown's teacher, but you don't know what I'm saying. Wah, 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 right? If you're not laughing, I know exactly who you are anyway, so. Or number two, they heard it, but they refused to believe it because they inserted their own agenda and didn't want what the Lord wants. Well, isn't that what Peter says? Forbid it you, Lord, that that would happen to you. Get thee behind me, Satan. I think we can learn many things from Luke chapter 18, but I want to draw one simple conclusion from our text. My proposition to you this morning is this. You can always trust God's word to be reliable and true even when you struggle to understand it. Did Jesus tell the disciples the truth? Did they understand it? Did they trust it? No. But you, my friend, you can always trust God's word to be reliable and true, even when you struggle to understand it. I want to expose very quickly in the time remaining three truths found in Luke chapter 18. They are these. Number one, God is always faithful to his word. God is always faithful to his word. Number two, God's love for you caused Jesus' sacrifice. God's love for you caused Jesus' sacrifice. And number three, victory only comes through Christ. So let's consider this first truth. God is always faithful to his word. Look with me at Luke 18, verse 31. Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. Alfred Adersheim lists 456 Old Testament verses that directly refer to the Messiah. Some have come up with more. Conservatively, Jesus fulfilled at least 300 prophecies in his first journey to earth from the Old Testament. And many of those Old Testament prophecies give precise details about Jesus' trial and death. For example, Zechariah 11, 12 through 13 speaks of the 30 pieces of silver that Judas would get for betraying Jesus, and it says that he would purchase a field where he would ultimately die with that silver. 
Isaiah 53, 7 says, Jesus would be silent before his accusers are dumb, like a lamb being led to the slaughter. So he opened not his mouth. Verse 9 of Isaiah 53 says that Jesus' burial place would be with the wealthy, in a wealthy tomb. And we come to find out that is Joseph of Arimathea. Amos 8 verse 9 foretells that darkness would fall upon the face of the earth when Jesus died, and it was so. Did you know the New Testament directly quotes Psalm, the book of Psalms, 68 times, all being related to the person and the work of Jesus Christ? If you want to know Jesus the Messiah, read the Old Testament. Really? But pastor, that sounds counterintuitive because Jesus is in the New Testament. Well, yes, he is. But in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the topic of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. This is not history. It is his story. And so when Jesus says, I have to go and I have to fulfill everything that the prophets have written about me, he is being God. And you can appreciate it. Jesus will fulfill every single promise in the Bible. And that is why we can trust it. I adore Jesus' label for himself here at the end of verse 31. All things that are written by the prophets concerning what? The son of the man. You can't see the word the. But is the son of the man. Who is the man? B besides Kevin. It's actually Adam. Jesus is a son of Adam. Are you? You indeed are. Adam the first man bringing sin into the human race. Most people, when they read the Son of Man, don't understand that it is a quote from Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom, the one which shall never be destroyed. Who is that referring to? Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of Man. Jesus exists as the Son of God in eternity past. He is the second person of the Trinity. He left heaven and was conceived in the womb of Mary and born into a human family. He serves as our representative before the Father, Adam being the first man who brought sin into the human race and Jesus being the last man, fully God at the same time, that will extinguish sin from the human race. Did you know Daniel goes on to say in chapter 9, verse 26, about this Son of Man, that the Messiah shall be cut off. Killed. Extinguished. To be made no more. But then the next phrase in Daniel 9, 26 says, but not for himself. But for whom? It's for you and me, dear friends. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? This is the whole point of going to Jerusalem, where he would suffer and die and take upon him the wrath of God upon the sins of the world, so that if you believe he is your substitute for sin, you can have eternal life. We call that salvation. What is clear is that the Old Testament says the Messiah would die. I'm not Jewish. I'm kind of Irish, French, English. But back in this time, these Jewish disciples would have known the Old Testament scriptures through and through. 
They spent three years with Jesus. They knew him. He was clear to them that he would go and he would die. But why didn't they get it? I think it's the same reason why you and I will often read God's word and not obey it. Because we don't get it. You see, you can have your devotions on a particular topic and you say, wow, that really spoke to me and I need to make these changes. And then 10 minutes later, what are you doing? Violating the principle once again. Did you hear it? Sure. Did it impact you enough to change your lives? Ah, there's the difference. So Jesus didn't hide the fact that he would suffer and die. The Old Testament doesn't hide the fact that he would suffer and die. But the words just did not sink into their hearts, even though it hit their ears. Dear friends, you can always trust God's word to be reliable and true, even when you struggle to understand it. The ideal would have been for the disciples to say, I don't get it, but Lord, you said it. And we believe it. But that's not what happened. God is always faithful to his word. You can trust him. Number two, God's love for you is what caused Jesus' sacrifice. Look at verse 31 again. Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, all, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished, for he will be delivered to the Gentiles. Huh? I thought they were Jewish. He will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him, and they will kill him. You know, the most stunning aspect about Jesus' death is that he was willing to go through this for you and for me. In saying that we are going up to Jerusalem, he is admitting that he's accepting the Father's will and he's going to the cross by choice. We often don't realize the scope of the prediction that's listed here. You know, realize for the disciples, it would have been shocking for Jesus to say, I am going to be delivered to the Gentiles. Jews hated the Gentiles. But specifically, who are the Gentiles that Jesus is referring to? The Romans. The Romans. And what would the Romans do? They would crucify our Savior on a Roman cross. In order to be delivered to the Romans, we have to ask the question, who is delivering him? And the answer would be, his brethren, the Jews. He is betrayed by one of his own disciples, Judas. He's taken to the Jewish high priest and the leaders of Israel try him and find him guilty and want him dead so they will bring him to Pilate and hand him over. The Romans did not grab Jesus. The Jews handled him and handed him over. And in so doing, both Jews and Gentiles were involved in the Savior's death. You know what's glorious about that, though? Both Jews and Gentiles can also be involved in the Savior's re resurrection. It's not just for Israel. It is also for us. And so, there is a purpose in Christ's prediction. Jesus is telling his disciples the plan ahead of time that's not random. It's actually been purposed in place since the foundations of the world. This is God's plan. Over in John chapter 10, verses 17 through 18, he says, Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up. This command have I received from my Father. Yet again, Jesus says, I am going to die. Despite the fact that there is no human court that could ever authoritatively try, convict, and sentence Jesus to death. 
He is willing to humble himself and to be obedient unto the death, even the death of the cross. Is there any greater love than that? There is no greater love than this, that a man lays down his life for his friends. The disciples get it? No. Not in that moment. But just because they didn't get it, do they have a right to doubt God's love? No. It wasn't unloving to take Jesus away from them. It was the greatest act of love. Did they trust the Lord in that time in which Jesus would be crucified? Nope. But you can always trust God's word to be reliable and true even when you struggle to understand it. We've seen that God is always faithful to his word. God's love for you caused Jesus' sacrifice. Finally, let's see this morning, victory only comes through Christ. Did you see that last phrase in verse 33? And the third day, what? He will rise again. The expectation of victory is found in those words. It took time for them to understand that victory is now available through his death and resurrections. Did the disciples eventually come to understanding that the empty tomb was victory? Yes. But they needed more teaching. And so for the 40 days in between the resurrection and the ascension, Jesus teaches them the whole meaning. They needed to be taught that the resurrection from the dead meant that God satisfied his wrath with a sacrifice made on the cross. As Paul says in Romans chapter 4 verse 25, Jesus was delivered up because of our offenses. And he was raised because of our justification. Now, while salvation is indeed an instantaneous act, learning more about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is a life commitment. Paul goes on to say in Romans 8, 11, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Because the Son of God died for your sins and was raised from the dead, you have victory and eternal life if you believe on the Messiah's name. But there's this idea of there's a lack of understanding for many. And we still see it with the closest followers of Jesus in verse 34. And if we don't talk about verse 34, our message is not complete this morning. Now, in the Greek language, to make things very strong, you make a sandwich. I know some of you guys just popped up because I said the word sandwich. We're almost done. If there is a negative, you make it stronger by adding another negative. And if you want to make it even stronger, guess what you add? Another negative. So with that in mind, look at verse 34. But they understood none of these things. Number one. Number two. This saying was hidden from them. And then final phrase. They did not know the things which are spoken. How many negatives here? Three. It's as strong as you can get. Luke's description can't be any more harsh. He's written over and over, I'm going to Jerusalem to die. I'm going over Jerusalem to die. We looked at five of them. In the Gospels, there's much more. He has said it over and over and over. And here they are with Jesus when walking around for three years doing this. They're not listening. Did Jesus need to tell them he was going to Jerusalem to die. No. You know why? 
because the scriptures were already written for them. And the Old Testament testifies over and over that Jesus would die. Yet, some way, somehow, when Jesus is crucified, where are the disciples? Nowhere to be found. John is at the cross. But did the crucifixion come as an utter shock to the disciples? Yes. Yes. My dad passed away almost seven years ago. It'll be seven on February 16th. He was suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia for many years prior to his passing. We lost him long before he actually passed away. When the phone call came in the middle of the night, it was painful, but it was victorious. Dad was whole, free of pain, no longer suffering. While we were not looking forward to the moment, we were anticipating the moment. Jesus says, I'm going to die. The disciples may not have appreciated the moment was coming. But in this text, they weren't looking forward to it either. They missed it. Despite all the warnings, they didn't know that their Lord was going to die. Let me close this message by asking you a few questions. Are we really any different? There are seasons of life that we go through that we are finding great difficulty, where we seem lost. Yet the whole time, isn't the word of God sitting right in front of us where it has addressed such difficulties and struggles? Yes, indeed. We, we teach here that the Bible is sufficient for every one of our needs. Do you believe that? Okay, but do you practice that? Or do you forget? Do you listen to the lie of Satan that makes you doubt God's love for you? What could God possibly do for you that is greater than killing his own son on your behalf? And yet when Satan whispers in your ear, nobody loves you or cares for you, you are worth nothing. You can come back and say, I am worth the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I am not a conqueror. I am more of a conqueror because of him who loved me so. You can trust God's word, friend. And you can know that God loves you. Third, what is prohibiting you today from understanding God's word? In the case of the disciples, what was it? Themselves. Is the same true for you? The disciples have this preset mind, plan in their mind. And we saw it. Peter goes, no, 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 no. No, that can't happen. And James and John want to sit at the right hand of Jesus in the kingdom. Their idea is that Jesus is going to now liberate all of Jerusalem and all of Israel from Rome and then rule. Well, he is. But he had to die first because that's what his plan was. And they didn't like his plan. They rejected it. They were not listening to God's plan. Just as many Christians today will open the Bible, hear a sermon, hear something on the internet or radio, Read a devotional and say, oh, I need that. But you know what? I, I, I'm not listening to that. It is a choice for you to follow and obey God. In a few weeks, we're going to see how Zacchaeus is an illustration of a story of how Jesus' plan is to indeed set up God's kingdom on earth but it's not yet. It has to be done through his death, burn, resurrection first. I read the story of two psychiatrists, excuse me, psychiatrists 
who met together at their 20th college reunion. One was very vibrant while the other looked withered and worried. And so the withered and worried one looked at the vibrant man and said, what's your secret? Listening to other people's problems every day, all day long, year after year, has made me into an old man. You know what the vibrant one replied? Who listens? <laughs> How many Christians come to church Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, th through, sit through Sunday school class, a worship service like this, go to an afternoon or a p.m. service, Bible study after Bible study, devotional after devotional, and yet they don't grow because they don't listen. Is that you? That's the disciples here. Now, I don't want to be too harsh because, remember, this is now we're stretching towards Easter. They're going to get it. <laughs> it's just got to take some work. And, and you can get it too, but it's going to take some work. But, dear friends... Don't be the kind of Christian that is so super exposed to the word of God, yet you have nothing to show for it because you won't listen and obey. That's the failure here. Listen and cherish the word of God. And if you want this to be a New Year's sermon, what a great theme for this coming year, right? You can always trust God's word to be reliable and true even when you struggle to understand it. Father, I pray.